Who is the great magician who makes the grass green? E prime is English without the use of any form of is or being. We're trapped in linguistic const constructs. All that is is metaphor. I believe somebody said that before me. I've decided we can't get beyond words. What we got to do is get more cynical about our words. You'll find that by dispensing with is and trying to reformulate without is, you just naturally fall into the kind of expression which is considered acceptable in modern science. And also, it's the type of consciousness that the Zen Buddhism tries to induce. Using E prime, you will understand modern science and Zen Buddhism both a lot better than you've ever understood them before. Martin Gardner has written a long essay proving that to think like this will destroy your mind. I, I, think, it, I think it adds tremendously to clarity. I am removing the is from my writing more and more. Removing it from your speech is even harder. Instead of thinking the grass is green, to think the grass appears green to me. And this saves me a lot of time, uh, by the way. I don't get embroiled in arguments like Beethoven is better than Mozart or rock is better than soul. I define such things as meaningless. And so people get into arguments like that. I just say, well, Beethoven seems better to me than Mozart most of the time. But I don't say Beethoven is better than Mozart. People would by and large act a hell of a lot more sanely. And especially if they, you know, when they got rid of is, they dropped, they put maybe in more sentences. I think if everybody used maybe more often. The, the increase in general sanity would be absolutely, it would, it would seem absolutely astonishing and completely flabbergast everybody. What the hell is this? We suddenly got a planet full of sane people. When did that start to happen? I didn't even notice it. You just listen to the craziest people on the news and on television or the craziest columnists in the newspapers. You notice they never say maybe. They're always quite sure. And there's always no is. And they never say seems. They always say is. People start arguing about words and they're mostly arguing about whether the words that they apply to the objects they have created out of the infinity of uh, possible objects that could be put together. They picked up a few of them, and they put words on them, and they quarrel about the words. And if, uh, if these people get to the stage where they're willing to kill one another over the words, they should be put in a nice, quiet home in the country with kindly doctors and beautiful nurses and good sedatives. But generally, they end up in government mansions and start bombing one another. Or they lead religious crusades for the true faith and kill one another with swords or some such thing. I, I think my writing comes out of anger and optimism. Anger at the stupid, maniacal, or corrupt crowd that's running the world at present, and optimistic about the opportunities that are so real. This, as I say, is the result of uh, my outrage, my horror, my grief, and my anger at the, the way the world has been going lately, and my continued optimism that maybe enough people can wake up on time to change the direction we're going in. So I got both optimism and anger, which I think is a good mixture. It keeps me busy anyway. I have a lot of hope. I thought I may be the last optimist left on the planet for all I know. But at the same time, I see really terrible problems and injustices and violence all over the place. I just think we're, we're heading for a point at which that will no longer be viable. Somehow we're going to have to find a more decent form of society if we're going to survive at all. <clears throat> You can only write about what has impinged upon your nervous system strongly enough to leave a powerful imprint. And I, when I was 12 years old, they opened the Nazi annihilation camps. I think that's a very vulnerable age for imprints. I grew up feeling I, live, I was living in a race of monsters. And I've lived all through the Cold War, the Vietnam War, and a lot of other tragedies, personal and otherwise, and uh, I, can't, I can't write fiction without violence in it because violence is so much part of the world I've lived in. It's obvious they're getting, they're getting closer and closer to the edge where they can cure anything. Meanwhile, the world is moving closer and closer to the edge where they can kill us all. <laughs> it's very interesting. Science is going in one direction and the politics is going in the other. I'm still an optimist. I think, I, I think eventually people give up doing stupid things. Uh, 
It's like walking into a wall over and over. Eventually you start looking at the door and you do something intelligent. <laughs> Every human race has to do something intelligent in the next 10 or 20 years and it just can't go on screwing up everything. If you want to be the most depressed person in the world, get up every morning, remind yourself George Bush is still in the White House, <laughs> and then listen to CNN for a while, where you'll find out that American bombers are pounding another part of Afghanistan. But if you think about George Bush and other gloomy things every day, eventually you get pessimistic enough that eventually you'll take an overdose of the sedatives your doctor gave you to control your depression, then you'll be out of it. I mean, we'll do it every day. Want to become a concert pianist? Do it every day. Want to be a writer? Do it every day. Want to become depressed? Think of depressing thoughts every day. Want to become an optimist? Think of cheerful thoughts every day. Do it every day. Hope is the master of the next breath. Who creates every reality and experience. The word yoga means union. Uh, yoga comes from the same root as the English yoke. Two things hitched together. And you need a human brain. Dogs see grass differently. After all, you need the human brain and you need the grass hitched together to make the yoga, which we call the greenness of the grass. Now, everybody thinks it's very hard to be a mystic. You've got to go through a hell of a lot of effort to realize your union with everything. But actually, you're experiencing your union with everything all the time. Otherwise, you wouldn't be experiencing anything. <laughs> you make the grass green. You make your highs and you make your lows. But you don't do it alone. You're making it out of your union with the universe. And so everything is a coincidence of contraries. It's a coincidence of you being there and the universe being there. And everything is one at the same time because there's no green without the grass and there's no green without you. So the greenness is a transaction that ties you and the grass together. There's an infinite expanse of signals flooding into our nervous systems and being processed by a higher neural centers in the brain. We're all organizing and orchestrating it according to our own particular life history, our genetic background, our early imprints, our conditioning, our learning, and any re-imprinting techniques we may have learned since then. So we're all living in different worlds. It's astonishing that we can communicate at all. But you are the co-creator sight you see, the sounds you hear, and your general impression of the universe. Our experience is generated by us. We're not generating it out of nothing, but we are generating it. We are creating the reality tunnel we're experiencing from moment to moment. So there's a total unity between you and the universe, whether you're aware of it or not. The universe you live in is your creation. <laughs> uh, but you're not doing it consciously. When you have seen the one who makes the grass green, it's like meeting your own father in a crowd. You'll have no doubt whatsoever. Nasruddin went galloping through Baghdad one day on his donkey. He went up every street and into every alley and across every plaza. So he was galloping all over this, every place he could go, and an unending race and hunt and search. Everybody got curious, everybody came out of their houses and they were all yelling, Nasruddin, Nasruddin, what are you looking for? And he yelled back, I lost my donkey and I'm looking for it. See, the, uh, the donkey represents the, what everybody is looking for, which is a mystical school. It's the answer to all the riddles of the universe. And you hunt for it east, west, north, south, up, down, everywhere you can imagine. All the time it's carrying you around. It's the human nervous system which takes out of the infinity of the universe the little reality tunnel that you, that you consider reality, which is your creation and which you think is the whole of the universe. Unless you've been through a Sufi school or studied general semantics or did a lot of Zen meditation or dropped LSD once or twice, then you realize the universe is much bigger and more complicated than any little map we can make of it. The map is not the territory. The words that describe the map are not the territory, even further from the territory. <laughs> what I've been doing is trying to put the donkey on your back in such a way you'll never forget. The master, the great magician who makes the grass green, the one who creates the whole universe you live in.